If you don't have a goal, you suffer, and then you get cruel and bitter and resentful, and then you start to actively try to make the world a worse place. Mm. And so, so, because you can't <clears throat> suffer pointlessly without becoming bitter, and you can't become bitter without becoming cruel. So you need an aim. The question is, then the question of course, is what aim. you should aim. Yeah, <laughs> a better aim. Yeah, a better aim, that's for sure. <laughs> so then the question is, what should your aim be? Welcome everyone back to the School of Greatness podcast. We've got the legendary Jordan Peterson in the house. Good to see you, sir. Good to see you. Very excited about this. You've got a book out called 12 Rules for Life. Make sure you guys check this out. You probably already got it, but if you don't, I'm telling you, go pick it up right now. An antidote to chaos. Uh, you've had so much attention over this last couple of years, and I've been digging into the research and just been fascinated by everything that you've been up to. And I just love your stance on the vision you have for humanity in terms of how we can all live better lives. And I think you simplify a lot of things in this book, which some things people don't like to simplify. They mm -hmm. like to complicate. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what's gotten you a lot of attention is that you try to really simplify a lot of these things. Well, I try to make everything concrete so that it's right. actually implementable. Right. I mean, there's a lot of high level abstractions in the book because it ranges up into the theological and the philosophical, but it's always grounded in what you can actually do in your life practically. Mm -hmm. You want to bridge that gap from the highest abstraction down to the lowest level of behavior so that it becomes implementable. And that's how philosophical concepts take on their meaning, right? Because they have to they have to have some impact on the way you see the world and the way you act in the world. Or they're not fully realized, they're not understood. Because partly what we mean, I would say, when we say that we understand something, it's kind of a strange phrase to understand something, but it means to be able to embody it in a shift of view and a shift of action. And then you've got it. It's graspable. It's in your hand. Embody something in a shift of view? Mm -hmm. Well, they're, the same, well they're the same thing, eh? because your perceptions are very tightly linked to your actions. Because, of course, when you're acting, you're aiming at something. You have to be devoted towards some, some, some aim, some target. Right. We, we play that out in sports all the time. Yeah. That's why sports are so entertaining for people, is because they dramatize the idea of aim. Right, and then, and not only of aim, but of the pursuit of excellence in pursuit of that aim. That's the game. And the reason it's a spectacle and the reason that people participate in it is because it dramatizes something absolutely essential about life. And so you want to take philosophical abstractions and you want to use them to, to structure your aim. And then your perceptions organize around that aim. Mm. And then you act it out. And then you've got it. That's, then then it's, it's become part of your life. Mm -hmm. It's not just an... It's, just, it's not just a philosophical abstraction that floats free in space. Why is there so much conflict in, in the world? Is it because there's so many different perceptions that people have? On well, what they think should be right or what sure. they should Well, be part of it is, part of it, of course, there's conflict because we have real problems. And so life is actually difficult, independent of, the, of psychological foolishness, let's say. Independent of the obstacles that we put in our own path. It's life already is challenging. It's already, it's already fatally challenging. Right, life is the ultimate challenge. We will die. Yes, yes, and so there know, is as well. a challenge. Yeah. Yes. Uh, well, uncertainty, no, no, no. fear, pain, all those. Yes, things. all yeah. the thing, all everything that goes along with suffering, is a challenge, and it's 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 the full challenge because it takes everything you have, and so, part of the reason we disagree is because there are complex problems to solve, and then we also disagree because we're willfully blind and because we're more ignorant than we should be, and we're not everything we should be, and we tilt towards malevolence from time to time, and we betray each other and ourselves, and so we take a bad lot in many ways and make it worse. Now, not always, obviously, and we don't have to, but right. that's sort of the baseline that we're working against. I think people are most disappointed in life when they're disappointed in themselves. You know, they see Absolutely. that they've made things worse than they had to be, even though the baseline can be pre pretty brutal. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and so the book, and all my lectures, I suppose, are, are, are put forward in an attempt to take the high-level philosophical abstractions and to make them into something that's actionable. And to take so. the next best action in your mm -hmm. life to mm -hmm. improve your life, mm -hmm. so we don't have to suffer as much. Mm -hmm. Well, and hopefully also so that people around you don't have to either. So one of the things I've yeah. been talking to my audiences about is 
the relationship between responsibility and meaning, which mm -hmm. is, the, uh, uh, what would you say, it's a, it's a constant refrain in the book. It's mm -hmm. one of its underlying um, um, messages, let's say, or themes is a better way of thinking about it. Um, you know, if, if you start with the presumption that there's a baseline of suffering in life and that that can be uh, exaggerated by as a consequence of human failing, as a consequence of malevolence and betrayal and self-betrayal and deceit and all those things that we do to each other and ourselves that we know that aren't good, that amplifies the suffering. That's sort of the baseline against which you have to work. And, and, and it's contemplation of that often that makes people hopeless and depressed and anxious and overwhelmed and yeah. all of that. And, and, and they have the reasons. But you need something to put up against that. And what you put up against that is meaning. Meaning is actually the instinct that helps you guide yourself through that catastrophe. And most of that meaning is to be found in the adoption of responsibility. So if you think, for example, if you think about the people that you admire, mm. well, you think about when you have a clear conscience first, because yeah. that's a good thing to aim at, which is something different than happiness, right? Um, a clear conscience is different than happiness. Yeah, it's better. Yeah. That's you're not better. Like guilting yourself, you're not feeling bad about yourself. That's right. You feel yeah. that you've justified clean. you've justified your existence, yeah. right? And so you're not waking up at three in the morning in a cold sweat thinking about all the terrible things that you've involved yourself in. Mm. What you, you know, said to someone that you shouldn't have said, mm -hmm. or how you acted, or, mm -hmm. lied, or what or opportunity you lost, or or, mm -hmm. or 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 yeah, or or the things that you've that you've let go that you should have capitalized on, mm -hmm. and all of that. And so, if you think about the times when you're at peace with yourself with regards to how you're conducting yourself in the world, it's almost always conditions under which you've adopted responsibility, mm. right? At least the most, the most guilt I think that you can experience perhaps is the sure knowledge that you're not even taking care of yourself so that you're leaving that responsibility to other people because that's pretty pathetic and I, unless you're psychopathic. And you know, and, and you're living a parasitical life, and, mm. and that that characterizes a very small minority of people, and an even smaller minority think that's justifiable. But most of the time, you're in guilt and shame because you're not, you're you're not. Not only are you not taking care of yourself, let's say, so someone else has to, but you're not living up to your full potential, and so there's a existential weight that goes along with that. So, so you suffer even more mm -hmm. when you don't take care of yourself or take the best actions or do the work that you know you can do and mm -hmm. you rely on someone else to support you financially, emotionally, mm -hmm. physically, whatever, you know, home, whatever it may be. Yeah, well, because you're not only, you're not only not being what you could be, you're interfering with someone else being what they could be, right? So you're, you're, you're not only a void, you're a drain. Right. Jesus, that's a catastrophe. And but we then, usually don't even know it when, in the, when we're in that situation because mm -hmm. we're in a depressed state or we're... Or we don't want to see it. Mm -hmm. You know, you wake up at three in the morning and you know, and so, and then you think of the people that you, so you admire yourself, or perhaps you can at least live with yourself when you're taking responsibility, at least for yourself. And so that settles your conscience. But then if you look at the people that you spontaneously admire, and so the act of spontaneously admiring someone is the manifestation of the instinct for meaning, right? And so this is partly why people are so enamored of sports mm -hmm. figures, because yeah. the sports figures are playing out the drama of attaining the goal of attaining a certain kind of, let's say, psychological and physical perfection in pursuit of the goal. That's the drama. And to spontaneously admire that is to have that instinct for meaning latch onto something that can be used as a model. And then that model should be transcribed into something that's applicable in life. You know, and you really like to see in an athletic performance, you really like to see someone who's extremely disciplined and, and, mm -hmm. in, and in shape do something physically remarkable. but. And, and to stretch themselves even beyond their previous exploits because you really like to see a brilliant move yes. in, a, in an athletic match. But you also like to see that person ensconced in a broader moral framework so that not only are they trying to win and disciplining themselves in pursuit of that victory and then stretching themselves so they're continually getting better, but they're doing it in a way that helps develop their whole team and that's mm. good for the sport in general and that reflects well on right. the broader culture. They're a great leader right. in their team, they're positive, they're good uh, sportsmen against their competitors, yeah. they're not negative towards the other people, they're lifting them up too, yeah. like the ultimate that's right. so that human. They, that's right, so that they can, they can work for their own improvement in a way that simultaneously works for the improvement of their team and, that, and, and for the sport. And, well, and then to the degree that that spills over into the broader culture, so much the better. Right. So that's all being dramatized in a, 
in an, in an athletic event. And it's really, it's not philosophical, it's concrete, right? It's dramatized in the world, and that's what the games represent. And so, well, and it's partly because, well, in some sense, life is a game. It is. It is, in that you're always, the, the analogy is that in, in life, like in sports, you're, you're, you're setting forth a name, and then arranging your perceptions and your actions in pursuit of that aim. And that you also generally do it while cooperating and competing with other people. Right. So that's also the game-like element as well. And all yeah. of that's dramatized in athletics. Yeah. That's like philosophy for people who aren't philosophical. And I'm not being smart about that. Yeah. You know? It's like it really is philosophy for people who aren't being philosophical because it's played out. You know? And you can see it too. You can see the spontaneous appreciation for the human spirit manifest itself when you see people rise to their feet spontaneously mm -hmm. in a sports arena when they see someone do something particularly remarkable. You see an athlete who's extremely trained stretch themselves beyond what you'd think is a normative human limit and yeah. everyone celebrates that like spontaneously. So it's quite something to, yeah. to behold. And so take me back to responsibility and meaning yeah. <clears throat> when we're watching sports or someone do this act. What does this do for us with, in terms of responsibility and meaning? Well, it, 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 it helps us figure out what we can imitate. Gives us a model. Right? Yes, it's a model. Right? It's a model of something that I respect. Mm -hmm. Well, even what philosophy is, or even theology for that matter, is an abstract model. Like it's laid out in words. Now the problem often is, is it becomes so abstract that people don't know how to bring it back down to, to, to embodiment. Yeah. Yes. Whereas something like, like the drama of a sports event is sort of midway between philosophy and action, right? Mm. It's, so it's, it's not entirely abstracted because it's not only coded in words. It's acted out. It's visual. You can see mm -hmm. an example of what just happens, mm -hmm. and you can try to reverse engineer how they mm -hmm. did that. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, exactly. Well, at, le at least you, the fact that you admire the person means that you might start to try to act like them. Now, mm -hmm. it's not easy, and maybe that, would mean, maybe that would mean that you start to discipline yourself with regards to a particular sport, but it might also be that you start to mimic or are at least affected in some way by their, their sportsman-like sportsman behavior, right? Yeah. Which is the ground of a certain kind of ethic because if you can play well with others which is sort of the hallmark of a good sport then that actually means that you're a reasonably sophisticated and civilized person it's really important to learn to play well with others there isn't yeah. that's the ground of ethics and if you can do it there in that setting then hopefully you could translate it into life well, setting well right that's exactly right that's, that's what the goal you, well that's what you hope for right. yeah that's the goal of the so if the if the goal of the game is to put the ball through the ball into the net then the goal of having games is to produce people who can take proper aim no matter where they are right that's exactly what we're trying to do with mm -hmm. with 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 athletics so uh, uh, so I've been talking to my audiences a lot about that about the and well and there's more to it too because if the background of life is is there's, a, there's an ineradicable component of suffering and that's complicated by, let's say, malevolence and the proclivity of people to betray themselves and others, which, which complicates it and makes it worse. Then the, if you don't have a noble aim and, and, and if that isn't imbuing your life with sustainable meaning, then you fall prey to all the catastrophe, the pain and the anxiety and the anger that that suffering generates and that makes you bitter. Because what I'm hearing you say is that and correct me if I'm wrong, we must have an aim in our life no matter what stage of life we're mm -hmm. in. And if we don't have some type of aim, even if for a few months of an aim mm -hmm. of going somewhere or direction, mm -hmm. we're gonna, the suffering's gonna be even more suffering. Mm -hmm. because, Pointless. Because we're already gonna face the greatest challenges in That's life. That's right, you're we're stuck with We're already struggling. That's right, there's no way Adversity out of Adversity is coming no matter what. That's right. If we have big goals or mm -hmm. small little goal or whatever it may be, but it's going to be less suffering if we mm -hmm. have an aim. Yeah, well, and, and not only that, it's worse than that even because the suffering is <laughs> pain. zero meaning. Well, well yeah. the suffering is pain and the suffering is anxiety and uncertainty and the suffering is hopelessness. But the consequence of all that is that you get bitter. And when mm. you get bitter, you get mean and you get cruel and you start to hurt yourself and other people. So it's not only that if you don't have a goal, you suffer. It's that you, if you don't have a goal, you suffer and then you get cruel and bitter and resentful and then you start to actively try to make the world a worse place. Mm. And so, so because you can't <clears throat> suffer pointlessly without becoming bitter and you can't become bitter without becoming cruel. 
So you need a name. The question is, then the question, of course, is aim. what you should aim. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Aim. yeah better aim, <laughs> that's for sure. So then the question is, what should your aim be? Now, we have a program. Mm -hmm. It's one of the things I wanted to talk to you about yeah. today. I, I have this website called selfauthoring.com, and that program helps people write about their life. And so there's a past authoring program. To, to, to establish your aim, you have to know where you are. It's like you're trying to orient yourself on a map. You can't orient yourself on a map unless you know where you are. You yeah. also have to know where you're going, right? So those are the two relevant things. The past authoring program helps people write about their lives. So it's a guided autobiography. We ask people to break their life up into six epochs, six sections, and then to write about the emotionally important events in those, in those epochs and to detail out why, why the positive things happened and why more of that could conceivably happen in the future and to detail out why the negative things happened and to try to understand why with an aim to not replicating them in the future because the purpose of memory isn't to remember the past. The purpose of memory is so that you, you figure out what went wrong when something went wrong so you don't duplicate it in mm. the future. So that's yeah. the purpose of memory. And the past authoring program can help people catch up and you know you have to catch up if you have memories that are older than about a year and a half that still cause you emotional pain when you mm. think about them or if you dwell on them they come spontaneously back to mind it means you haven't it means that there's part of your life that you haven't mapped out properly and it still has emotional valence that's gripping you and you're still you holding on to that story or it's yeah. still holding on to you mm, interesting. right you haven't right. let it go yeah yeah well you haven't been able to navigate your way through it you there's a pitfall there that you fell in and you don't know how to avoid similar pitfalls in the future and that's why so your you brain won't it. let it go because uh. it's saying that's what the anxiety systems do it's like this happened to you it wasn't good this happened to you it wasn't good this happened to you it wasn't good fix it fix it fix it fix it that will never go away unless you fix it. How do you fix it? Well, you have to figure out why it happened, right? That's the first thing is like, how did you, how was it that that situation arose to pull you down? Mm. And that's not simple. That's why, well, that's why we have the writing program because right. it's complicated to think <clears throat> it through. But, you, but if you face it and you, and you meditate on it, let's say, and, so, and you do this voluntarily, there's a pretty high probability that you'll be able to decrease the probability that will be repeated in the future. So... And and this, <clears throat> go ahead, I don't want to cut you Oh, off. well, well we, the, the second part of the program helps people do an analysis of their virtues and their faults. Mm -hmm. Same sort of idea. What's good about you that you could capitalize on? What's weak about you that you need to fix so that it doesn't bring you down? Right? And that's the present authoring. But the future authoring program is probably most relevant to mm -hmm. you and your listeners because you're interested in helping people establish aims. And so we already talked about the fact that you need an aim in life or... or that's where you derive your meaning and without that things go to hell and and as literally as that can be taken and so but it's not easy to, to ask people to say well it's easy to ask them what do you want in your life it's a very hard question to answer because it's too right. vague right, and, right, right. and grand eh? so we help in the future authoring program we help people break that down it's okay so here, here's the situation so you put yourself in the right frame of mind so what's the right frame of mind it's like rule two in this book Treat yourself like you're someone responsible for helping. You're someone that you are responsible for helping. So what that means is you have to start from the presupposition that despite all your flaws and insufficiencies, that it's worth having you around and that it would be okay if things were better for you. So you need to take care of yourself like you're taking care of someone you care for. So there's a bit of a detachment in that. And then the next thing is, okay, so now look three to five years down the road. Okay, you get to have what you need and want, assuming you're being reasonable mm -hmm. and that you actually want it, which means you're willing to make the sacrifices that would, that would make it possible. What do you mean by reasonable? Well, that, that's, that's the next thing. Well, within your grasp, that would be something. What if something know, is out of your grasp, but you still push hard enough well, to then potentially you need, get it. Then you need an incremental plan, Got right? It. Yeah, you need yeah, to course. break that goal down into steps Not that you... Not some crazy goal within a year that's yeah. like, yeah. you haven't even done the work to master a skill yet. Yeah, I got yeah. well, that's it. And you can have a high-end goal and more right. power to you if you With do, but you need frame. it. Yeah. Well, you need a pathway to yeah, it. Absolutely. You know, if, you're, if it's 10 stories up above you, you need a staircase to get there, right? right? And so you have to build the staircase too. Right. Right. And so in the future authoring program so you're asked first of all okay here's you get to have what you want and need that's the proposition but you have to aim at it you have to define it and aim at it so here so then the first thing is okay uh, if you could put your family together the way you wanted it to be what mm -hmm. would that look like and mm -hmm. so that might be your siblings and your parents but that also might be 
you know, your wife or your husband and your kids, assuming that you're at that point in your life. If you could have the family you wanted, what would that look like? Right, okay. Career, same thing. You get to have the career or the job that, that is within your grasp, necessary and, and suitable for, for you if you were mm -hmm. taking care of yourself. How are you going to educate yourself? Because you're not as smart as you should be. There's a lot more things you need to know. So you've got to keep learning and moving mm -hmm. forward. So you need to plan for that. How are you going to take care of yourself mentally and physically? Right? So um, how are you going to avoid the, the, the catastrophic temptations, for example, of drugs and alcohol? Because that pulls a lot of people down. You need a plan for that. You're going to be a social drinker. How much are you going to drink? How much is too much? What about your drug use? Mm. You've got to regulate that so it isn't a pitfall. How are you going to use your time meaningful and productively outside of work? Because you need to plan for that. So that's, um, and there's one other that, that, I, that slipped in my mind said, at the right? moment. Yeah, I think there's seven <clears throat> initial questions and I don't, I don't remember the last one. Um, oh, intimate relationship, of course. Mm -hmm. So you have, you, do, you want, do you want a long-term stable intimate relationship? And if you do, then how would you like that to lay itself out? You've got to have a vision for that because if you don't yeah. have a vision, you're not going to aim at it. Absolutely. And if you don't aim at it, then you won't even see the opportunities when they arise. That's the thing that's so cool. I wrote about this in chapter 10, which is, be precise in your speech. It's a chapter about the fact that aim structure your perceptions. So for example, once you aim at something, your brain, literally, the perceptual structures in your brain, in your visual cortex, reorient themselves to calculate a pathway to the aim. And then what they show you in the world is obstacles to that path and, mm -hmm. and open pathways to the path. That's actually how the world reveals itself. Just like, just like when you're driving in a car and you have a map, and you, or you aim at a particular place, then all the things that right. are related to that place show up in the world. It's exactly the same thing. Because yeah. you are traveling through time and space, right? And you need a map. And so, so after you answer these seven questions, and you're encouraged to do it badly, because mm -hmm. you don't have <clears> to just get perfectionistic, yeah. just complete it, right? <laughs> because a bad plan is better than no plan. It gives you something to improve. Mm -hmm. So even if your aim is vague, and even if it's off target, if you start aiming, and you see you're off target, then you can shift and you can make it more precise. You start to recognize what you don't want in that. Yes, thing. exactly. Say, exactly. oh, I thought I wanted this, but I don't. Exactly. So let me re-navigate and figure out what I do exactly. want. Exactly. And you might have to try a bunch of things. You, well, you will have to. You right. can be, that's why you shouldn't get perfectionistic about it. You mm -hmm. will absolutely be wrong, but you won't be as wrong as you would have been if you were aimless. Right. Right. So it's a, so there's a bit of no humility. No man's land. No man's land is, is not worse good. than going No man's somewhere. room is a bit worse than a bad path. Yeah. That's exactly right. Ooh, I like that That's, one. that's, that's a, a good, good one. <laughs> that's a good one. And it's right. It's right. You don't want to be in no man's land. Why did you use that phrase? Because that's right. That's exactly I right. I think um, for me, uh, the idea of walking around aimlessly is like the worst idea in the world. It's like zero purpose, zero mission, zero certainty at all. It's well, it, like walking around in no man's land right. aim, aimlessly. But it's funny too because in no man's land, everybody's shooting at you. Because right, that's a military term. Right. And no man's land is the space in the between middle two enemy positions. Yeah, yeah. You bet. So if you're aimless, you're also at a place where everything is shooting at you. Dang. Yeah, so it's a very good that's metaphor deep. that came to mind. Wow. Yeah, well, that's why, that why I remarked on it. That's very, very <laughs> cool. So then we say to people, okay, look, now, okay, now you've thought about this for a while. It's nice to do this over a couple of days, too, because mm. then you get to sleep on it. And that helps reorient yourself. Yes. So then, okay, now you write for 20 minutes. Don't worry about grammar or spelling. This isn't a... This isn't a, a composition exercise, right? You get to have what you want three to five years down the road. What does your life look like, hypothetically? Mm -hmm. Write it out, yeah. write it out. Okay, so then that's the first part. The second part of the exercise, so now you've got your thing to aim at. You think, well, I'm motivated because I got my thing to, thing to aim at. Yeah. It's like, you're not as motivated as you could be because you don't yet have your thing to run away from. Because if you really want to be motivated, you want to be going somewhere and you want to be not going somewhere else. Which typically is a pain, mm -hmm. right? Yes, a or pain a, or a anxiety. Or yeah, some, yeah. some domain of suffering and guilt, yeah. let's say. I don't say. want to feel this anymore. Yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, so the other thing we ask people is, okay, now take stock of your weaknesses and imagine that you let them multiply. You got hopeless mm -hmm. and you augured in and things were as bad for you as they could be in three to five years. What are some examples of weaknesses that people might have? They lie. Uh -huh. They procrastinate. Yeah. They avoid, they're grandiose, they're narcissistic, they're undisciplined, uh, they're nihilistic, they're aimless, 
all of those things. Got it. Yeah. Right? Um, victim they, mentality. Victim yeah. mentality. They take the sh they take the, the the quick way out. They mm -hmm. pursue impulsive <clears throat> pleasures. They sacrifice meaning for expediency. They don't take care of their basic responsibilities. They fight stupidly <clears throat> with their parents. They don't they don't negotiate properly with their spouse. They are bitter at work because they haven't said what they have to say. Mm. They haven't thought through what they're doing tomorrow. They drink too much. They smoke too much. They take too many drugs. They don't regulate their don't their work out. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so there's like got it. and so everyone knows, weaknesses. man. Yeah. Everyone knows, and everyone's got a set of weaknesses yeah. that they know about. And so we say, all right. What are some of your weaknesses? Like three weaknesses <clears throat> that you know right now you could still work on, and then three things that you think are really well. A lot of in. things. A lot of things are things that I've taken care of in my life. Like wow. I used to smoke when I was a kid. I smoked a pack a day. I used to drink a lot. I didn't work out. Like there, there, there. I wasn't nearly as disciplined as I should have been. Yeah. Um, I wasn't as careful with what I was saying. Like I, there, and I, I suppose loose. my yeah. most likely negative outcome probably would have been I really like to drink. Like alcohol is a really good drug for me. Is that I enjoyed why you did your thesis on that? Um, well, partly it, it was mostly because the opportunity came up for me uh, to to investigate drug and alcohol mm -hmm. use. But I came from a little town in northern Alberta. It was a heavy drinking town, and yeah. and uh, that that could have been a real trap for me. Right. You know, and 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 and. So anyway, so we have these people who say, okay, now you know your weaknesses and you know what particular hell you would descend to if you allowed yourself to descend into it because you've probably had a taste of it. It's like you really let that go and you're in a terrible place in three to five years because you haven't done what you should do. What does that look like? It's like everybody writes Write that down. down. Yeah. Write it down so you know because one of the things you want to have behind you, let's say you have to do something difficult like go confront your boss. It's like, well, maybe hope isn't enough to encourage you to do that. You think, well, no, if I don't encourage... If I don't go confront my boss carefully and mm -hmm. intelligently, right. then I'm going to hate my job and then I'm going to drink more. And then I'm going to end up in that little hell place that I designed for myself. It's right. like, oh, I'm not going there. Well, I don't want to talk to my boss or I don't want to confront my wife or my husband, whatever it is, or my father or my children for that matter. But if I don't, then I'll resent myself or I'll resent the situation. I'm going to end up going okay. down this yeah. terrible pathway. It's like, yeah. because sometimes... When you're moving forward, you have to do something difficult. You might think, well, why bother? And the answer is, well, so I don't end up in hell. Yeah, How yeah. about that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, there's that. Because <laughs> it's a so, deep, if you don't uh, experience the pain now or the difficulty now, mm -hmm. you're going to have a deeper pain later. Yeah, yeah, that's life. A much man. deeper pain yeah, later. Yeah. And that's why I think that you mentioned at one point is like putting ourselves in um, – structured pain like structured mm -hmm. sense of feeling pain throughout the day mm -hmm. whether it be the tough conversation mm -hmm. i don't want to do that it's painful but i'm going to because i know afterwards mm -hmm. it's going to probably feel better mm -hmm. it's a bit There'll of a sacrifice yeah. right so you sacrifice yeah. stability in the present for a gain in the future that's the big discovery of human beings and, and were you sacrifice big, works exactly and were you a big athlete growing up no no but as no a, well as i was a, a small kid and i right, skipped right. a grade yeah. although i skied and i went cross-country skiing That's and that, it's individual sports yeah. things mostly with my dad you'll understand then in order to improve as an athlete or in any sport mm -hmm. you have to put yourself through daily pain yeah right if you want to achieve that model of excellence that you watch someone playing basketball mm -hmm. as a child and you see someone living this model it's going to be 15 years of deliberate pain. Yeah, that's a discipline. That's man. it. Yeah, well, I worked out for a long time with weights, you know. And, so you know. Yeah, you felt yeah, it every yeah, day. Yeah, yeah. You didn't want to push through the pain, but yeah. you knew that it would get you a greater result. Yeah, well, and it's easier not to do it than to do it, but not yeah, in the did. long run. Yeah, exactly. You know, I've really seen the benefits, for example, for weightlifting because I've watched mm -hmm. people. Because I'm 58, 50, how old am I? 56. You look great. You know, I'm, so I'm getting older, and I've really noticed the difference between people and when they age. Um, between people who laid down a good physiological platform when they were young and those who didn't because by the if you haven't worked out weights particularly yeah. I would say you start to get pretty soft in your 30s and your cardiovascular system starts to go and really early the other thing too is the best thing you can do to maintain cognitive uh, ability isn't to do exercises like lumosity it's not brain exercises mm. that keep you sharp it's exercise so Physical. if you're 50 both yeah. cardiovascular and weightlifting. If you're 50, you can restore your cognitive function to the level of a 30-year-old through exercise. Your, your mental function mm -hmm. through physical activity. Yeah, well, your brain is a very demanding organ. And if your cardiovascular system is compromised, then you get stupid. And wow. so, yeah, it's really... So the less I, you I, move and the bigger mm -hmm. you get, the more stupid you become. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, Smaller because your you, brain gets you, well, you compromise, you compromise its function. Because the brain is a, it, it's, it's, it's the organ that uses more... 
it's, it's very metabolically demanding. And so if you're not in, phys in good physical shape, then the, one of the things that suffers most greatly is your cognitive function. And so mm -hmm. that's quite an interesting thing to see how tight that linkage is. So in the next part yeah. of the program, we have people, now it's okay, now you've got your vision. Yeah. Even if it's a bad one, it's yeah, still okay. That's right. Well, it's better than no vision at all, right? It's better something no that you can brain. improve. Yeah. Well, think. You're trying to get through a territory you don't understand. And here's your option. No map. A map that's not so good but has some <laughs> things about it. Or a great map. Well, right. obviously, the great map is the thing you Ideal, want. Yeah. But the, the map that's something is way better than the map that's nothing. Plus, as you explore, because of your map, you can start to fill in the details. And you start to learn, and you start mm -hmm. to overcome stuff, and you mm -hmm. start to master skills mm -hmm. on your journey, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's the other thing, too, is like, let's say you, you aim at something, and you, and you develop some skills along the way, and then you get like a third of the way there, and you think, oh, that's not for me. It's like, well, yeah, fair enough, but now you've still got the skills you developed. You know exactly why it's not for you now instead of mm. vaguely. So you don't have to keep going after that exactly, way. Exactly, exactly. Well, and you have a rationale. Yeah. And then you can bring that wisdom back, even though it's not perfect, you can bring it back to your next plan. And so. And take responsibility yes. for the next steps. Yeah. Yes, yes. And so yeah. as you plan, you get better at planning, which is the crucial thing. So, so then we say to people, well, take your positive vision and make it into eight stateable goals, right? So, and then rank them in a hierarchy because you need to know what... Like a top goal and yeah, then yeah, and, incremental goals. Yeah, and, and, and that, well, that's the other thing is break the goals into incremental goals so that you have a reasonable probability of succeeding. So, because what you want to do, this is also what you want to do with a kid. You don't tell your kid, here's an impossible thing. Why don't you go out and fail? You say, here's something worth going after. Here's a step you could take that would push you beyond where you are but that you also have a reasonably high probability of succeeding at, mm -hmm. right? They call that- Within the, a time frame. Mm, yeah, within yeah. some time frame. That's the other thing. You have to parameterize it with regards to time frame. That's right. And that puts you in the zone of proximal development. And that's a, that's a concept that was generated by a guy named Vygotsky. He was a Russian developmental psychologist and a smart one. It's where the idea of the zone comes from, mm, to be in the zone. Yes. And when you're in the zone, you're expanding your skills at, in a manner that's intrinsically rewarding because you're succeeding and so you want to set if you're good to yourself you think okay i need to set a goal but i need to set a goal that someone as stupid and useless as me could probably attain if they put some effort into it right. and then you got then you've got it perfectly because it's not so high that it's grandiose or impossible that you fail necessarily and then justify your bitterness it's like well i could do well that because that happens to people <laughs> happens and, all the time yeah it's like this all the time you know it's like it's, yes, exactly. Well, I set a goal and I didn't attain it, so I'm not going to set any more goals. Right. It's like, no, you set a goal that was inappropriate. For the you, time frame. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's right. You didn't calibrate it properly. Yeah. And, and you're playing a trick on yourself because you wanted to fail so that you could justify not having to try. Well. And being a victim. Mm -hmm. yeah. Which isn't even helpful. You're still going to be a victim. It's yeah. like, there's no way out of that, man. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, because life is, this, life is a challenge that in some sense can't be surmounted. So there's no way out of your problem. But there are certainly proper ways of dealing with it. Yeah. And so you so lay you out those eight, those eight steps. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Lay them out. And then the next thing is, okay, you need a rationale for them because you're going to have doubts and other gonna, people are going to put up obstacles. Is that so a you meaning to, you mean? Is that hmm? a meaning? A rationale means a meaning? Yeah. Yeah. A justification. Yeah. It's like, okay, so here, what sort of justification is a good justification for your goals? It's easy. Why would it be good for you? Okay. Why would it be good for your family if you attain that goal? Why would it be good for the broader community? Because if it's a good goal, it should be good for you. That's fine. But if it's a really good goal, it should be good for you in a way that's good for other people. Win, win, win. Yes, exactly. And, you, and if you're going to decide what your goals are, why not set up the ones that benefit the largest number of the people maximum. simultaneously. Yeah. Yes, and if you can do that, you should start with your own concerns because you have yeah. to take care of yourself. Basic needs first. Yes, put your own Family. oxygen mask on, then put your child's oxygen Community. mask on. Yeah, right. And then you can, as you as you build up a, the basis of competence locally, you might develop enough skills so that you can expand that outward. Mm. And it also gives your goal a certain amount of nobility. And so, and if someone yeah. challenges yeah. you and says, "Well, why are you doing that?" That seems stupid. You could say, I'm doing that because it helps me take care of myself, but it benefits my family, and here's the reasons why. And this is the repercussions out into the broader community. And like people aren't people who are putting up objections and doubts aren't aren't armed to deal with that kind of response. Yeah. And then when you have those doubts in your mind that plague you, 
which they and you go back to your reasons. You go back to your reasons. You <laughs> your say why? That's right. You say why? Why am I doing this? Oh yeah, it's because well I have to take care of myself because otherwise I'm pathetic and useless and bitter <laughs> and cruel and then and I'm going somewhere terrible. So that's a bad idea. And here's how it would help my family. And here's how it would help the community. And that's good enough set of reasons for unless I can think of better ones. Right. Right. If without better ones, that's good enough. Because I think the question <clears throat> comes back to, after you know. Someone could go down the rabbit hole and say, why, why am I doing yeah. this? And why is this, you know, meaningful for me? And I think a lot of people go back to, well, why am I here in the first place? Yes. Moment? Yes. Why am I here? Mm -hmm. What is the meaning of my life? Mm -hmm. And is this real mm -hmm. or is this just some dream mm -hmm. world? Well, and then, then, that, then people do go back to that. And then they get stuck on that. Yeah. What, like, but none of this even matters because... Why am I even here? Well, the, the thing is, is that that's a self-defeating set of propositions yeah. in some right. sense because the consequence of being stuck there, no the reason you're stuck there to begin with is because you're not very happy about the fact that life is intrinsically tied up with suffering because mm -hmm. you wouldn't be asking that question to begin with. Okay, so if you let that pull you in and take you down, all it does is make the suffering worse. Absolutely. It's not helpful. And then, and then the cascade that we talked about happens. You suffer stupidly and pointlessly. You, you get bitter. <clears throat> you get cruel. Yeah. You make everything worse. It's like, that's your answer, is it? You're going to make everything worse. It's bad enough. You're going to make it worse. <laughs> Mostly people won't do that consciously. Yes. So you think, well, what's the alternative? Well, here's one. If you have a sufficiently noble purpose, the suffering will justify itself. And I think, I think that's empirically testable. And I do believe it's the case because I've watched people do very difficult things like people who work in palliative care wards. So all they're ever dealing with is pain and death, right? And they can do it. They get up in the morning, they go to work and they take care of those people. They lose people on a weekly basis and yet they can do it. And what that shows is that if you turn around and you confront the suffering voluntarily, you find out that you are way tougher than you think. It's not that life is better than you think. Life is as harsh as you think. It might even be worse, but you are way tougher than you think if you turn around and confront it. And so then what you discover is that there's a spirit within you that, pursues, that can pursue something meaningful, that has the resilience and the strength to contend properly with the catastrophe of existence without becoming bitter. That's actually the central. So, mm. and, and I would say that's one of the central themes of 12 Rules for Life is that make no mistake about it. Like the first noble truth of Buddhism, life is suffering. This is true. And it's worse than that because it's suffering contaminated by malevolence. That's the baseline. But, and so that's very pessimistic. But the optimistic part is that you are so damn tough, you can actually not only deal with that, you can improve it. Mm. It's like, hmm, oh, well, that's a horrible situation. But it turns out that I'm armed for the task. Well, that's, that's a great thing for people to know. And I do believe, I think the fact that we're armed for the task is even more true than the fact that life is catastrophe contaminated by malevolence. We're stronger than things are terrible. So, and things are pretty terrible. So that means we're pretty damn strong. <laughs> wow. Yes, it's a very good thing to know. And it's not naive optimism. Yeah. It's a very different thing. It's like, no, things are terrible. They're brutal. And you are so damn tough, you can't believe it. Mm. So, wow. What's, mm. what's been the biggest challenge in your life that you've had to overcome or the biggest suffering that took you the longest to get beyond to improve? 